Dare to Lead by Brene Brown questions popular beliefs and notions about contemporary workplace culture and teaches us that the essential qualities for effective leadership are vulnerability, trust, and tenacity. You'll learn about how to be vulnerable and the power of vulnerability. You'll learn about how to build trust with others. And you'll learn about how to get rid of the perfectionist mindset. Here's a quick tweetable summary to describe this book in a nutshell. Great leaders are courageous enough to embrace vulnerability. Effective leadership is not about hiding our weaknesses or ruling with an iron fist. It's about vulnerability, self-awareness, empathy, and the personal power to show up when others simply will not. A few crucial quotes from the book before we dive in to the big ideas. Quote, If we want people to show up fully, to bring their whole selves, including their unarmored whole hearts, so that we can innovate, solve problems, and serve people, we have to be vigilant about creating a culture in which people feel safe, seen, heard, and respected. Quote, The courage to be vulnerable is not about winning or losing. It's about the courage to show up when you cannot predict or control the outcome. And the final crucial quote, Daring leaders work to make sure people can be themselves and feel a sense of belonging. Ready to dive into the big ideas? Let's get into it with big idea number one. Embrace vulnerability. At the outset of the book, Brene Brown tells us that courage, it's contagious. To scale daring leadership, as she calls it, and build courage in teams and organizations, we've got to cultivate a culture in which brave work, tough conversations, and whole hearts are the expectation and armor is not necessary or rewarded. Now, developing the courage to put the armor away and be vulnerable isn't about winning or losing or competing. Instead, it's about the courage to show up when you don't know exactly what's going to happen when you do. Effective leadership, it takes courage. It takes strength. However, courage and strength go hand in hand with vulnerability. With courage comes honesty a deep understanding of opening up to the tribe that you are trying to build or lead. Vulnerability, she says, is not a sign of weakness, but a sign of real strength and courage. Being a courageous leader does not mean that you need to act fearlessly. It means that you act despite the gut-wrenching feeling of fear. You take action and move with trembling hands. In 2014, Brene interviewed a group of American soldiers about leadership and how it relates to vulnerability. Here's what her interviews revealed. Despite feeling courageous and robust, these feelings always, for the soldiers, came with feelings of vulnerability. Embracing vulnerability doesn't mean that you become a weak, powerless individual. It means that you take risks, you act. You face adversity, you solve problems, and you do the work despite the uncertainty that goes hand in hand with being a leader or an innovator. Vulnerability and courage are inextricably linked. You can't have one without the other. Essentially, vulnerability is a crucial ingredient in the recipe for creativity and innovation. Of course, those who allow themselves to be vulnerable open themselves up for massive failure, but They're also often the ones who dare to dream and act and fail. The ones who become the innovators, the pioneers, and the history makers. So here's an actionable insight for you from this first big idea that you can apply within your own life. First, remember that you want to embrace being vulnerable. Embrace vulnerability. Open yourself up to the possibility of giving yourself fully to give of yourself fully and wholeheartedly instead of shying away and holding back. 
Vulnerability is a vital component of effective leadership. It helps build trust, it inspires others, and it allows you to truly connect with those you lead. And by the way, for more on embracing vulnerability and to gain a little bit more insight on this idea, you can listen to a free podcast that we've created over on my podcast called Dean Bakari's Meaningful Show. And you can listen to it on all the podcast platforms by visiting the link deanbakari.com slash go slash vulnerability. That's D-E-A-N-B-O-K-H-A-R-I dot com slash go slash vulnerability. Now, let's move on to the next big idea. Big idea number two, choose your top two values. During times of uncertainty and vulnerability, your values will guide you and pull you through difficult times. The most thoughtful leaders, the most effective leaders that Brown came into contact with for research for this book were those who had clear, definitive values for themselves. Daring leaders are, they're certain, they know what drives them. They have a purpose. Their values act as a guiding light through challenging times. When things get difficult, their values are the things that help pull them through. They energize them. They help them remember what truly matters. Now, as a leader, knowing what's important to you is crucial. Brown's extensive research on effective leadership and the interviews that she did, the leaders that she came into contact with, revealed that the leaders who identified their two most important values were the ones that exhibited the most courage and embraced vulnerability more than those who listed 10 or more values. So your actionable insight for this second big idea is clear. Identify your own values. Now, gaining clarity, it doesn't have to be complicated. Write down a list of your core values. Just take out a sheet of paper and jot down all of the values that matter to you that you can think of. First, just free form, data dump, brain dump, jot them all down. Don't stop until you've got it all out. And then once you've got this list of all the values, your core values, whether those are your individual values or whether those are the values that you also relate to that have already been defined by the company that you lead or your organization, whatever they may be, just get a list of values, core values down, whether that's leadership, technological advantage, inspiration, managerial skills, honesty, integrity, environmentally friendly, whatever those values are. Doesn't, there's no right or wrong here. Get a list down. And then, most importantly, identify the top two fundamental core values from that list. And then use those values to guide you and propel you through your own difficult times. Being clear is the key. So choose your top two values, write them down on a card, and review them on a daily basis. Remind yourself of what matters most. Big idea number three. Feedback is important. Quote, Giving feedback is incredibly vulnerable for this reason. If you're giving good feedback, you should not be able to script what's going to happen when you sit down with someone. You should be willing to be able to hear. Unquote. Feedback is an important part of leadership. If your goal is to be an effective leader, it's important to understand the art of providing feedback. Honest feedback. In the book, Brown emphasizes the idea that giving honest feedback is kinder than bending the truth as to not hurt someone's feelings. For example, let's say you're providing mentorship to someone who wants to become a best-selling author. Speaking half-truths about their writing will give them a false sense of hope. Instead, provide them with a constructive analysis of their work and give them honest advice about what they need to do to improve. Brene talks about leaving empty space, giving others the opportunity to voice their thoughts and feelings. 
being able to listen effectively is part of providing feedback. Brown illustrates the importance of feedback by recalling a time when she herself experienced some cold, hard truths from her own employees. The author's employees gave her some constructive criticism regarding her time management skills and her unrealistic timelines and deadlines, which they often found challenging to fulfill. The honest feedback she received was a bitter pill to swallow, but she was grateful for it nonetheless, because she believes that clarity equals kindness. Leadership is not about the stroking of egos. The true sense of leadership, the true essence of it, lies in the give and take, the push and pull, the speaking and the listening. So, your actionable insight for this big idea is this. The next time you provide feedback to an employee, a friend, or a mentee, try this. Speak, listen, and leave enough space for them to express their thoughts and feelings. When you receive feedback, listen attentively. And remember that feedback is an essential component for growth and success. Big idea number four, build a culture of trust. Quote, it turns out that trust is earned in the smallest of moments. It's earned not through heroic deeds or even highly visible actions, but through paying attention, listening, and gestures of genuine care and connection. Unquote. As a leader, what does trust mean to you? Brown describes trust as something that's earned by paying close attention, by compassion and deep connection. Her extensive research revealed an acronym that describes seven behavioral patterns that encourage trust. The acronym is BRAVING, B-R-A-V-I-N-G. The B is for boundaries. This focuses on respecting others' boundaries and learning to understand that we all have different boundaries and different levels of comfort. The R in braving is for reliability, being trustworthy and reliable, doing precisely what you say you will at any given time. The A is for accountability, taking responsibility for your own mistakes and apologizing whenever necessary. The V is for vault. Think of yourself as a vault of knowledge or information that's been conveyed to you over time. Passing on confidential information will eradicate trust and hinder progression. Therefore, it's vital that you abstain from gossip and maintain your integrity by keeping other people's sensitive information locked in your own vault. The I in braving, stands for integrity. Make courage your ultimate choice. Do what's right rather than what's comfortable. Make sure your actions fall in line with your values. The N in braving stands for non-judgment. People should feel comfortable telling you how they feel without being afraid of judgment. The G stands for generosity. You build trust when you're generous, open, and and when you recognize positive qualities in others rather than negative attributes. So that's the BRAVING acronym. Here's your actionable insight from this big idea. Cultivate the following behaviors to build a culture of trust. Make a conscious effort to respect boundaries. Practice reliability on a daily basis. Take full responsibility for your own mistakes. Be mindful of the information you leak to others, make courage your ultimate choice and practice what you preach, and finally, focus on bringing out the best in people rather than harping on about how terrible they are at this or how incapable they are at that. Big idea number five. Being prepared for failure makes you brave. Quote, we need people to be braver and we need to create a culture that allows for bravery, unquote. Learning how to fail cultivates bravery, and here's why. When you learn how to fail, you are prepared for adverse situations. You build resilience, self-awareness, and courage. 
For example, skydivers spend hours and hours jumping off ladders before they even attempt their first plane jump. They fail several times over and over and over again before they finally get it right. It not only strengthens the mind, but it promotes readiness. Leaders often teach resilience after the initial failure has taken place. But if you build that resilience and strength before it happens, you'll be prepared to face any situation or outcome. Resilience training is crucial. So teach your tribe how to fail before any failures take place. Brown practices what she preaches in her own company where resilience and resilience training is actually a compulsory part of the recruitment process. So here's your actionable insight for this big idea. Train your tribe on how to be brave in the face of failure. When you learn how to fail first, you cultivate bravery and prepare yourself to push forward and try again. Big idea number six, forget about perfectionism. Quote, perfectionism is a self-destructive and addictive belief system that fuels the following primary thought. If I look perfect and do everything perfectly, I can avoid or minimize the painful feelings of shame, judgment, and blame. Unquote. Perfectionism is a form of self-protection. It's armor, a facade that protects us from the real world. To become a bold, daring leader, you'll need to eliminate the idea of perfectionism. Perfectionism is more about seeking approval than self-improvement and striving to be the best possible version of yourself. Being raised in an environment where excellent achievement is praised and average performance is scolded leads to the cultivation of harmful belief systems, and thought patterns. Now, perfectionists are often people pleasers. Everything they do is centered around winning approval from other people. To be a daring and effective leader, you need to eradicate this damaging notion of perfectionism for yourself if you suffer from it. Studies have shown that she lays out in the book that perfectionism is often linked to anxiety, depression, and addiction. Perfectionism can prevent you from fully connecting and engaging with the world. Instead of thinking outside the box, you focus on creating the perfect outcome. And this can often steer you away from the right opportunity. Harboring a fear of judgment and placing too much focus on exceeding expectations can often prevent perfectionists from stepping into the fold and experiencing failure. And without a willingness to fail, and without a willingness to make mistakes, perfectionists prevent themselves from living life to the fullest. So, here is your actionable insight from this big idea. To be a daring and courageous leader, let go of the idea of perfectionism. Ask yourself how you can improve and minimize the importance you place on what others think of you. Self-focus is crucial here. Instead of looking outside of yourself and seeking approval, look inward and focus on true self-improvement. Brene sums up this big idea nicely with the following quote. Somewhere along the way, she says, perfectionists have adopted this dangerous and debilitating belief system. I am what I accomplish and how well I accomplish it. Please, perform, perfect, prove, Healthy striving is self-focused. How can I improve? Perfectionism is other-focused. What will people think? Perfectionism is a hustle. Unquote. Big idea number seven. Eradicate shame with empathy. Quote, shame cannot survive with a healthy dose of empathy. Unquote. Brene illustrates her point for this big idea using a story from her past. She talks about a time where she injured herself during a recording session for an upcoming book tour that she was doing. The injury resulted in her being diagnosed with a serious concussion. Now, her refusal initially to rest and allow herself to heal 
was a direct response to her feeling of shame of not doing it. An overwhelming feeling of fear and shame just consumed her. She was combative, frustrated, and unwilling to accept her condition. Now, researchers have revealed that unwanted identity is one of the primary elicitors of shame. They say that unwanted identities are characters that undermine our vision and our ideal versions of ourselves. Now, shame can be so enveloping that it can be hard to break free from this. She talks about a dear friend of her family expressing tenderness and empathy when she could no longer write or do research or think. She was crippled, and this tender talk that she had with her dear friend gave her some genuine insight, and it gave her some perspective about the entire thing. He talked to her about letting go of shame and letting go of the need to please and focusing instead on self-compassion. She passionately writes about finally embarking on this book tour after weeks and weeks of shame and fear. Love, empathy, and tenderness put shame on the back burner. Now, we are physically, spiritually, mentally, and emotionally hardwired for connection. Shame, on the other hand, is disconnection. Shame pulls us away from connection and throws us into isolation and fear. The definition of shame, as Brene outlines it in the book, is this. Shame is the intensely painful feeling or experience of believing that we are flawed and therefore unworthy of love, belonging, and connection. Shame is watching things change rapidly and not knowing how and where you can contribute. Shame consumes us sometimes, but when we open up and let people in with gentle hearts and open arms, shame can no longer exist. Where shame lives, empathy is almost always absent. Brown believes heavily in the notion that shame just cannot exist in the presence of empathy true empathy. The following quote from her bestseller, Rising Strong, sums up this idea of eradicating shame with empathy in a nutshell. Quote, shame is much more likely to be the cause of destructive behavior than the cure. Guilt and empathy are the emotions that lead us to question how our actions affect other people, and both of these are severely diminished by the presence of shame. Unquote. So here's your actionable insight for this big idea. Remember the human experience. Pay attention to feelings. As a leader, you'll experience shame and fear and feelings of inadequacy from time to time. Now, when you remember your own human experience and pay attention to true human feelings, you can transform a culture of shame into a culture of empathy and love. The most important takeaway here is to pay close attention to feelings and to remember that we are all human beings. Lean into this advice whenever you need to. Big idea number eight. Build confidence with self-awareness and practice. Quote, The behaviors that people need from their team or group almost always include listening, staying curious, being honest, and keeping confidence, unquote. Brene talks about grounded confidence, this concept of grounded confidence, and she defines this brand of confidence as follows. Grounded confidence is the messy process of learning and unlearning, practicing and failing, and surviving a few misses. This brand of confidence is not blustery arrogance or posturing or built on bullshit. It's real, solid, and built on self-awareness and practice, unquote. Grounded confidence elevates us. It supports our efforts to be brave. Having the grounded confidence to rely on the skills that you have developed over time allows you to focus on higher objectives. You must master the fundamentals in order to focus on the important stuff. She tells the story 
of how a professional soccer player practiced her ball control skills by kicking the ball against a brick wall over and over and over again for hours. Now, this is a solid example of how to build grounded confidence. Leaders need grounded confidence in order to stay connected to their values. They need to be able to respond without reacting emotionally. They need to be able to operate effectively from a place of self-awareness rather than a place of self protection. Brown also tells us that learning how to rumble with vulnerability takes work. It can be taxing and tiring on your brain, but that's a good thing. Practicing means that when you are experiencing vulnerability, grounded confidence will remind you that this is tough and it might even be scary, but you have practiced enough to get through it with confidence and self-belief. Grounded confidence equals rumble skills plus curiosity plus practice. Curiosity is an act of vulnerability and courage. Curiosity is connected to creativity, intelligence, enhanced learning and memory, and deep problem solving. Curiosity and comfort do not live in the same house. You must step outside your comfort zone to fully take advantage of your curious mind. Bad leadership focuses on quickly arriving at the outcome stage, whereas good leadership encourages curiosity, thought, and analysis. Good leadership is not supposed to be comfortable, just like mastering a skill and gaining grounded confidence is not supposed to be an easy walk in the park. Now, these are some of the curious questions and statements to focus on when you're problem solving or team building or merely just trying to get things done in the workplace. Some things that might start off a nice dialogue that is propelled by curiosity. Number one, the story I make up is. Number two, I am curious about. Number three, tell me more. Number four, that's not my experience. You start off a sentence like that instead of saying, you're wrong about this. Number five, hey, I'm wondering. Number six, help me understand. Number seven, walk me through. Number eight, you know what? We're both dug in right now. Tell me about your passion around this topic. Number nine, tell me why this doesn't fit or work for you. Number 10, I am working from these assumptions. What about you? Number 11, What problem are we actually trying to solve? You can use these sentence examples to open up a free and curiosity-filled dialogue in the workplace when you're trying to get things done or when you're working with your team or when you're having a one-on-one conversation with one or more employees. To lead effectively, you're responsible for understanding and respecting different views and opinions. Greatness It comes from curiosity and learning. Curiosity and learning build grounded confidence. So use intriguing information and questions to encourage curiosity. Because the more we know, the more we want to know. Here's your actionable insight. Keep listening and keep questioning. Keep learning. Build grounded confidence by learning, practicing, staying objective, and delving deep. And finally, remember the equation. Grounded confidence comes from your rumble skills plus curiosity plus practice. Closing notes. Key takeaway. Brown closes out her book by offering some words of wisdom from Joseph Campbell to keep in mind as we think about our own path towards daring leadership. The cave you fear to enter holds the treasure you seek. Now, adding on to that, Brown writes that You want to own the fear and the cave and write a new ending for yourself, for the people you are meant to serve and support, and for your culture. Choose courage over comfort. Choose whole hearts over armor. And choose the great adventure of being brave and afraid at the exact same time. Now this powerful closing paragraph of the book is really a beautiful way to summarize Dare to Lead. You want to be bold, vulnerable, and you want to step into your values. 
Lean into courage and step outside your comfort zone. Choose whole hearts, be compassionate to others, and be compassionate to yourself. Value self-mastery, look inward, and always remain curious and encourage others to do the same. Here are your final actionable insights before we close out this audiobook summary. First, have tough conversations with yourself. It's necessary. Avoiding them is another way of building protective armor around yourself to avoid shame and shy away from the truth. Next, remember that truth is kind. Lies are unkind. Telling lies might seem kind over the short term, but it often ends up hurting people over the long run. So tell the truth, even when it hurts, because ultimately, it's the kind thing to do. Next, identify your fundamental values and lean into them. Live them wholeheartedly and practice them fully. Next, give and receive feedback. Practice mastery and eradicate the idea of perfectionism. Perfectionism is a self-protection mechanism. Move away from it. Lean into true self-improvement. You don't have to aim for perfection to be valued. Value yourself first. Next, be brave, be vulnerable. Vulnerability lays the foundation for the following three skill sets. One, living into your values. Two, braving trust. And three, learning to rise. And finally, build a strong culture of trust by mindfully respecting boundaries, being reliable, and taking full responsibility for your actions and mistakes. Practice what you preach.